we'll continue on our uh, quick inversion, if you will, or our review of the Sermon on the Mount that we studied almost three years ago. And uh, so we're going to continue on just going through some of the highlights of the, of the messages that the Lord had given us. So we'll read, starting in verse 17, and um, we will read down through verse 25. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it is said of them by of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath fought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first. And go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. I agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast unto prison. Now, verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Let us look to our Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. We thank you, our Father, for the day that you have provided and blessed us with. And, and, and Father, help me especially to remember that every day is a blessing. Every day is a gift from God. And so, Father, I just ask that you be with us now as we've assembled together, that you give me liberty and unction from on high to present thy word in truth and in love, that, Father, it will not fall upon deaf ears, and that we will leave here saying it has been good to have been in the house of the Lord. We thank you for the songs. We thank you for uh, each one that uh, is singing tonight. And so, Father, we do pray that you just bless in the services. I ask, Lord, that you would continue as our brother prayed, that you continue to be with uh, Anthony and his family. And Father, for those that know you not as Lord and Savior, that they would come to know you as Savior. You'd be with Brother Joe and, and the, the condition that he has uh, right now. And then, Father, we pray for them spiritually. It would be thy will that uh, they would uh, seek out scriptural baptism. And, and Father, we just pray that you would uh, uh, be a, it, may we be a help in any way as far as leading them and guiding them through the Word of God. Lord, I ask that you bless that upon us. We thank you for the gift uh, from the, the Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, formerly Sovereign Grace Baptist Church of Galena. And Father, we thank you for the burden that you placed on uh, in the mind, us that you placed on their minds and those that they've given gifts to. Lord, we, we thank you for that. And we pray uh, for the members uh, of that assembly that they have found uh, good places to go and to worship you. And Father, I ask that again you'd go with us now in all that we do. Forgive us of our sins. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, so we're here in Matthew chapter 5. And again, for sake of brevity and the fact that we've been going over these things, I'm not going to just re-go over everything. So we'll just get right into it tonight. And we will get to verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Reka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. So we see here that as our Lord is continuing to teach, again, he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it that he begins here with the Sixth Commandment. Notice that he says it was heard. Well, because many of them didn't read, or many of them couldn't read. He have heard that it was said of them by old time, Thou shalt 
shall not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. We understand that there were not as many publications of the Word of God as we are blessed to have today. So they would all gather on the Sabbath day and they read together the Word of God in the synagogue worshiping. So they have heard the law. They have heard God's Word. And they knew God's Word. And every Sabbath, a portion of the law was read. And then it was followed by a reading from the prophets of the, of the Word of God. Not the prophets of that day, but the prophets. So they would read Amos and Jeremiah and Joel along with their reading of the law. Saturday after Saturday, the Jews sat there listening to the law of God. They heard the law of God. So our Lord says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. In other words, God spoke this. Now, those that read, it wasn't as if they were standing before the Jews. It wasn't as if they were standing before them Sabbath day after Sabbath day and making up things. No, they read from the law. They read from the very word of God. They read the prophets. They read from God's word. So it wasn't that they were just making it up, but they knew it. They had heard it. Just like it was written here in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. It says, Thou shalt not kill. The Lord is teaching that we do not see uh, a, a, again here God's law as the law of Moses, but we are to see it as the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And so it is, we must appreciate and treat it as such. And so our Lord continues and He unfolds to us the law of God in its fullest and greatest sense. And He gives to us again and He says, I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He goes on and he, and he continues and he says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now you read just a verse ago what the judgment is. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. So he's not taking away the fact that thou shalt not kill. That is still the law of God. That is still vital and true for us today. He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. So in the fulfillment, the Lord says, But I say unto you, it was said to you by God through Moses of old time, but I say unto you, the Lord says with all authority, that is definite, that word, I say, I am coming to you as the authority of God's word. I am revealing to you the more perfect way, but I say unto you, so the Lord does speak with all authority. Now, all of God's word is all of God's word. And we know from our reading in John that God says, the Lord Jesus Christ says, well, let's just turn there. In John chapter 1, he says in verse 1, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word, so the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking with all authority as the very Word of God, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. This is, this hits us hard. This hits us hard. The Lord is speaking to us that are believers. It means that in our behavior, we ought to behave kindly one to another. As the Word of God puts it, brotherly kindness. You can read about that there in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. And it says... 
and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So here in Matthew, again, our Lord is addressing us. He is talking to us as brothers and sisters in Christ, to the family of God. Though this is useful and it is good for all, for all families and for the way we deal with everybody, but brotherly kindness that we ought to have in the relationship that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's going right along with kind of what we're teaching about in the Sunday afternoon messages, right, in 1 John. You know, that family resemblance, the, that we are to have the likeness of Almighty God. So brotherly kindness is a non-negotiable. So when you come to this passage, and when the Lord says, but I say unto you, He is saying unto us. <laughs> now the backdrop of all this was that the Jews kept this sixth commandment. Again, they were law abiding. They thought that they had to live by the law. So they lived by the thou shalt not kill. And so what they believed is that it was the sin was abstained from so long as they did not strike the final blow, right? Or the killing blow. They then thought they were righteous in the eyes of the law as long as I don't kill someone in cold blood. That's not at all what our Lord is teaching here, though. And we understand and we know a little bit about murder, right? Murder is, is, is deep. Murder begins with the seed in the depths of the heart. And by definition, if we really think about it, we really think about this at one time or another. If we take these two words or these two verses as they're written here, we too would be ones that have committed murder. Now we don't like to think of our anger in that way. We don't like to think that our anger is that. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment shall be in danger of hellfire. <clears throat> we all want to. Trust me, I want to water that down. Right? But God's Word says what it says, and God means what He says. Yeah. And so bottom line, if we hate our brother or sister in Christ, it's what it says, we've murdered. You have heard that it is said of them of all time, thou shalt not kill. Right? Now, I know we got into a, a lot of this again, you know, in depth as we were teaching. So uh, I won't say all of that I said then, but to say this. So is murdering, you know, what, when is murder? So, you know, somebody breaks into your home and, and everything like that, and you're defending your family and you, you kill and, and, and somebody in your defending family, is that murder? Again, I would say very, very quickly, I would say absolutely try every other method before that. If somebody is in war and they are commanded of their officers to go and write, I mean, people in war kill all the time. The Bible is a bloody book. We see war. We see all these different things. What we're talking about here and what is being talked about and what the understanding is, is that of cold-blooded murder, just straight out murder. And he goes on to say in that kind of murder that whosoever is angry at his brother without cause. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15, God's word says this, Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer. That's what it says. And he, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 through 21, We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So anger into murder. That's what we're talking about. The seed of anger in our lives, beloved, must be stopped. The seed of murder must be stopped. 
In the New Testament, there are two Greek words for anger. The first is thumios, and it means like a flame. So, if you were to light uh, a, a, a bale of hay or straw, however you all call it, whatever you want to call it, I don't want to, I don't want to get it wrong. If you were to light it, it would engulf in flames, it would get hot really fast, and it would burn, and it would be done. Right? That's the first kind of anger. We all know that kind of anger. I probably exhibited a little bit of that kind of anger today. Right? The anger where something happens and phew, you respond. And it, you know, kind of quickly goes away. So that's the first kind of anger that's talked about as we read through the New Testament. <coughs> it's anger that rises up speedily and then speedily passes away. That's thumos. Now the second one is orge. O-R-G-A-Y. It describes a, long, a long-lived anger. This word or this type of anger is a person that holds on to anger and nurses it. And reignites it with every opportunity. It's an anger over which a person stews and meditates. Now get the person that you're thinking about out of your head. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, unfortunately, we've all probably done that too, right? That we don't think we're still angry about something, but, but the instant that it continues to hit us, we're like, Oh yeah, that made me angry before. Let me reignite that. Let me see if I can't get that going again. That's the other kind of anger that's talked about in the New Testament in the Word of God. And I'm sure that there have been times in my life that I've been guilty of both kinds of anger. That doesn't make it right. I'm not saying that because I have been guilty of this kind of anger that it's justified. The Lord didn't give justification here. He didn't say, well, if this is going on, you have right to have this kind of... He didn't say that. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And yeah, we'll be talking about anger without a cause here in a little bit. <clears throat> of the two angers, the two angers that are talked about in the New Testament, as you go through and you look up the word anger and you, you, you study them out in the Greek, neither one are accepted, and neither one uh, we should be doing. But the anger, I think, that festers the longest and the hardest is the second one. Right? The one where it, it, it comes and then we nurse it along a little bit. Right? And we've seen people like this. You know, the, the, just, just generally miserable looking. They may sing hymns and go through the motions, but they have a heart filled with, with pent up anger and pent up bitterness. Even though the Bible is very clear on what we're to do with bitterness, right? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, and I said I was going to get four messages in tonight, we're only halfway through the first one, so well on track to do that. <laughs> Even though the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us what to do with bitterness. It says in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's what the Bible says to do with those things. And so the anger that's talked about in Ephesians 4.31 is, is that second anger, that second usage of the word anger in the Greek language, orge, O-R-J-O-R-G-A-Y. The Bible says to let it go and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Beloved, when we think about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary for us, for our sins... Who are we to be angry with any other person? With any other person. And I, you know, I know that I haven't lived through some of the things that you all lived through. And I haven't lived through some of the things that other brothers and sisters have lived through. I, I haven't lived through if somebody, and, and these are the most outrageous and, you know, and, and gut-wrenching type stories, but... Um, even taking the, the example down in Pike County of somebody coming in and killing eight or nine members of a family, right? And then if there's any alive, you know, I haven't lived through that. And the human emotion and the natural emotion is that you would undoubtedly be angry. We would undoubtedly be angry if, if um, you know, somebody that we knew and loved was struck by, you know, even say a drunk driver, right? All of those. But the Bible doesn't give us a clause. There's no parent, there's no parentheses. There's nothing that says, well, 
you know, if this happened to you, then you have just cause to be angry. No, the Bible says to put it all away. It's, in other words, to get rid of it. Now, in a, in a movie that uh, some of you may have seen, The Secrets of Jonathan Sperry, uh, in that movie, there, there's an old, older man named Jonathan Sperry who has a lot of secrets. No, <laughs> there's the whole plot. No, he, it's a really neat movie, and um, I don't really want to say it in case you haven't seen it. I know you all have seen it. Have you all ever seen it? I don't want to just give it away. I can't. Okay. But there's a really remarkable scene that shows the love of Christ um, through, through the actions uh, that Jonathan Sperry did when he rightfully could have been angry. Let me just say it like that. And now if you ever see it, you'll be watching that for the whole time. You'll be like, this is when he was angry. I know it is. No, it'll catch you by surprise. So there is no parenthetical. There is nothing in between. There, it, it doesn't say anything else in Ephesians 4. It doesn't say, if this happens, then you're allowed to be angry. It doesn't say that. And nor does the Lord, I mean, he uses these direct words. You have heard that it is said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry without or with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So we've got to be careful with our anger. Also, if you would, turn to James chapter 1 and verse 20. James chapter 1 and verse 20. And the word of God says here, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Whatever your cause may be, if your heart is eaten up with passion and anger, your cause is wrong. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ forbids forever anger which stews within us. All right. Then we talk about, it says here, And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. Rekha. It's an Aramic word means vain or empty, to be a vain and empty person. Our Lord first treated anger as a feeling within the heart. He goes further and proceeds the case where we're angrier with our words and they display the feeling. And then we talk about Rekha. This is the effect of the reason why murder. It's because it's murder because you're basically saying now you're expressing your anger vocally. Rekha, you're saying you're good for nothing. You're empty-headed. Not only is it hate and murder, but it goes worse because it's a false witness. All right. So how can any of us that are God's children call anybody else good for nothing who is a brother or sister in Christ? Because all that have been saved by the grace of Almighty God are part of the family. <laughs> and that's what we've been talking about in 1 John. So who are we to cast that kind of anger or harbor that kind of anger, especially against our brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, here we go. I'm moving right along here. Now, we talk about this Aramic word. Well, you know, I, I guess I skipped over um, without cause. Let me just say, when I talk about that, that uh, many a times our causes, right? Again, because the Bible doesn't give a parenthetical, it doesn't say, it doesn't say in parentheses you can you can have anger now if this is going on. That uh, we really don't have just cause. Let me just say it like that. Okay. So then, here we go. We're moving on. So the Bible tells us over and over again to keep a close watch on our tongue and on our speech. That was a lot of what our vacation Bible school was based upon. That's what I taught in Sunday school a few weeks ago as we read through James, as we read in Psalm, as we read in the book of Proverbs, to watch our tongue. We talked about our tongues being a world of iniquity and uh, all those different things. So we're not. So that's why I knew I'd be able to go a little faster because we just did that not too long ago. It is Almighty God that, has helped us, that is able to help us control our tongue. He's the only one that's able to help us control our tongue. So we must ask God to help keep our tongue restrained. We do not do it ourselves. It is God that controls our tongue. He's the one that puts the bridle in our tongue. 
And we must make good use of our tongues. It's so sad to see so many that pray and sing glory to God, and then on the same day or the same week, uh, curses God with that same tongue. How shameful. And it, and it happens all the time. It doesn't just happen within our own church body. Hopefully it doesn't happen at all within our own church body. But um, those that profess Christianity, those that say they go to church, and then it's, it's like, how do you say what you say? And then on the other hand, you want, you want others to know that you're a Christian. It's just, just mind-boggling uh, to me. So pray for them that the Lord can make their, their heart. All right. Sweet. Those are the highlights. That's what you're getting. Moving on. Going now to verses 21 through... Well, no, I already said that. Huh. Moving on to verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath on against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. All right. The Lord Jesus Christ here is speaking about something that, again, the Jews are very familiar with. They're very familiar with this giving of gifts. He was laying down the principle which these Jews have known very well. The idea behind it is the concept of sacrifice. The Old Testament concept of coming to the altar and bringing your gift to God for sacrifice. Often not known to us today, right, that our... We don't, we don't think of it like this very much. We don't, we don't go through this, uh, through this kind of sacrifice, because the Lord Jesus Christ gave the once and for all sacrifice upon the cross of Calvary uh, for, the, uh, for our sin. But in this, this, is the, uh, this is the teaching. This is what he was uh, beginning to... They would understand this teaching is what I'm saying. Okay? And what I gather from this is that we see that there was there could be easily strife within God's house. We're talking about coming before the altar. We're talking about, you know, leaving the gift before the altar, not going in until you're reconciled. So it's all kind of matching up with the murder and the anger and all these different things. And so it is that before we come to the Lord's house, before we come ready to worship, before we come, we ought to get rid of any strife that we have with our brothers and sisters. They need to be, it needs to be resolved. It ought to be resolved. So, in other words, when we come to worship God, we need to remember or we need to think about if our brother has something against us, we need to get that figured out. We need to get it fixed. Otherwise, it's pointless for us to worship. It says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee. So even if we don't have something against the brother, but we think that but the brother still has anger or something against us, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way first. And go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. So if you have something against your brother, or if another believer has something against you, you need to make attempt to seek forgiveness. Principles of that laid out for us in the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and or through verse 21 and 22. Then came Peter unto him, or then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I mean, you know, Lord, I mean, I, I I'm willing to go seven times. My Peter, it's my Peter. If my brother comes to me and and sins against me. How many times should I forgive him? Seven? I mean, seven seems reasonable. I, I think that seven times... No, the Lord says, no, that's, that's not reasonable. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. 
Now remember, that seed of hate in your heart, our Lord has already called murder. So how can we rightly worship God when we have murder on our heart? This also would apply to the Lord's table. The Lord's table is not only a place of worship, but it's a place uh, where, where we fellowship and, and the union of God's people comes together. So it is that we should completely, fully forgive people. If you've wronged anyone, we should seek forgiveness from them. All right. We need to come to God in deep sincerity when we come to Him to give worship. And then finally, we continue on in Matthew chapter 5, and I'll read to you again just verse 24. Leave therefore thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So postpone your offering to God. Seek reconciliation with your brother. Remember, if you're not being blessed in the services, don't blame your pastor. Don't blame anybody else. If you're not being blessed in the services, you need to examine yourself. And if you have unforgiveness in your heart, you need to ask forgiveness. You will feel an incredible burden lifted off of you. Don't use the excuses, but it's not my fault, it's not my fault. We always like to say it's not our fault. We just need to go and seek reconciliation. That's what the Bible says. All right. It doesn't say you meet him halfway. It says you go to him and you seek out that reconciliation. Sometimes it is absolutely humiliating to admit that we were wrong. But... It's good for us to do it because God tells us to do it. And we're blessed when we follow the instructions of the Word of God. I would say oftentimes we come into the house of the Lord not truly having all of our differences sorted out. I'd say more times than we like to admit that we allow the little things to get blown way out of proportion. I'd say most of, or some of the times we have feelings of hate, which again is murder, and we have an unforgiving spirit. But it ought not to be that way for us as God's children. I mean, God offers forgiveness at the cross for our sins, and we ought to do that for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are, after all, as I just said, brothers and sisters in Christ. So as we close, remember, do not harbor hard feelings. You're not only affecting your worship with God, but the worship of the entire congregation can be affected. So, may God use his word and seal these truths to our hearts tonight. I thank you for your attention to God's word. Shall we stand together to be dismissed in prayer?